Hello all, this is Exploring Classical Music Podcast and Lika, your host. In this episode, we will explore the Baroque era in more detail, discuss the main ideas of that period, then we will get into more details on the popular musical instruments of that era, and we'll finish epi- the episode with a discussion on new, exciting, interesting uh, music forms that were developed during the Baroque period. Are you ready? Let's do it. One thing I forgot to mention last episode is that every time there will be a different theme music. This way, hopefully, you get introduced to more classical pieces and get excited about them. So today, what you've just heard is a suite by Bach, written for cello, as you probably have noticed, in G major. We will cover this piece at the end of this episode, so stay tuned. Baroque period lasted from 1600 till 1750, but it's not about the time. As I always say, the Baroque era specifically is about the time when the belief that words are the only communication tools was no longer accepted. Music was in its very development and over time proved to be just as effective as words and sentences that we use every day. While we can hear the development of harmony and musical notation is slowly becoming more robust, the music is still written in a very strict form. It's based on very specific rules that were set forth by the church, of course. So church played a major role in the development of music still in the Baroque era. Nevertheless, this period brought humanity its first absolute geniuses, such as Johann Sebastian Bach, George Handel, and Antonio Vivaldi. All of them we will cover in this podcast in the later episodes. And the reason for this is that these composers didn't always follow the church canons. Their music was not always accepted by the public and was definitely rejected by the church itself very often. And their masterpieces were forgotten. But thanks to them, we can enjoy listening to some of the best and most beautiful pieces today. This led to new music forms and the development of the first opera, where both tragedy and comedy themes were incorporated for the first time. Speaking of operas, you're probably wondering what is the first opera that humans ever composed? So technically, there was a composer named Jacopo Perry, who allegedly composed an opera sometime in 1590s, and it was called Daphne. But only a small portion of the music score survived to this day, so this is not considered to be the first opera. We can't even play the whole thing. And so the true first opera title belongs to Orfeo, written by Claudio Monteverdi in approximately 1607. That opera's music score we have, and we can reproduce it today. So there you have it. Okay, moving on to Baroque instruments. But before we get there, I promise a very quick summary of the types of instruments that exist out there, somewhere. All right. In my background, you are hearing the violin. Violin belongs to bowed strings, as well as cellos. In case you've forgotten how it sounds, please enjoy. This was a tiny piece of the beautiful Four Seasons written by Vivaldi. Okay, next up are woodwind instruments that include flute, clarinet, basson, and oboe. Right now you're hearing the flute in the background. Am I the only person who thinks that flute is severely underrated as an instrument? 
Okay, the next types of instruments that exist are brass instruments. And those include trumpet, horn, trombone, and tuba. And you're hearing my favorite trombone in the background. Okay, are you ready for the next type? Percussion instruments are drums, triangles, you know, things like that. Okay, so the final type are keyboard instruments, and this is the point which I wanted to get into. So piano is a struck keyboard instrument, and harpsichord, which is an early ancestor of piano, is a plucked keyboard instrument. The way piano is designed is that it has keys, a keyboard, and it has strings, a lot of them. And if you're talking about a grand piano, those strings are positioned horizontally and a normal piano has strings positioned vertically. But regardless of the type of piano, every time you press a key, there is a hammer that strikes those strings and thus produces the sound. I know what you may be thinking, no, it's not the same hammer you used to hang a picture on your wall, it's a different type of hammer. And so for Harpsichord, which is an early ancestor of piano, it was also made out of strings and keyboard, except that the strings were plucked instead of being struck by hammers. Another difference is that the keys were mostly black, like the opposite from what we see today. So early piano's keyboards were also predominantly black, with a few white keys. I guess everybody wonders why the keys switch from being predominantly black to white. One theory is that when a duchess, sometime during classical era, not Baroque, classical later, she was learning to play a piano, and it was very difficult for her to see and separate the black keys, so for her convenience, the keys were switched. And because this is honestly such a better design, it just happened to stay that way. Everybody appreciated it enough. And that's how we get the modern keyboard on the piano. Now, I have to confess, I am very, very biased. This is a big disclaimer. I used to play piano. And so in my humble and biased opinion, I think piano is a greater instrument than harpsichord. Even though harpsichord sounds amazing, I think piano is still better. And I can give you a reason for that. One of the greatest things about piano as an instrument is that you can play it both quietly and loudly. If you translate piano from Latin, that means quiet. And that's probably the hardest thing to do on a piano is to play very well, but also very quietly. And when piano was first invented, not many people liked it very much because they only thought that, you know, piano is such a loud, lousy instrument, it's difficult to play and things like that. And it's only because of the greatest composers that people realize that, oh, if you're good enough, you can play it quietly. And in many languages, piano is actually called forte piano, because forte is translated as loud from Latin. And so it means loud and quiet in many languages. In English, we just call it piano. As an example, take a listen to this prelude written by Bach in C major in harpsichord first. Don't get me wrong, it sounds amazingly beautiful, but did you notice that the entire piece was written in kind of the same level? There weren't points with white versus loud. So the next one is the same piece, but played on piano. Take a listen.
Okay, so did you hear the dynamics of music being quiet and then loud and then back to quiet again? The better a performer is, the better you can hear those dynamics in various pieces. That's how you can judge if a person is really good at playing piano versus not so good. Moving on. Another keyboard instrument is, of course, organ. And it's called aerated keyboard instrument. Objectively, organ is the most comprehensive and difficult to play instrument. A pipe organ feeds wind into pipes, causing the air to oscillate and produce a sound. An ancestor of pipe organ is the water organ, which was invented in ancient Greece sometime between 200 and 300 BC. The wind was produced by water supply. Then, after about 1000 years, architects decided to improve the bulky instrument and replace the water with bellows that produced strong gusts of wind. And this was the first pipe organ. Objectively, it is the most grandiose and comprehensive instrument of all, and the size ranges from a single short keyboard to a huge array of keyboards with over 10,000 pipes at a time. There is also a pedal keyboard with as many as 32 pedals. It was rare for one person to be able to handle the entire instrument of such size. There usually would be a few people playing the organ, except Bach of course. He was known and popular at his time for being the best organ performer, and this leads me to say he was the best harpsichord performer as well, but this topic is for later. An interesting fact, even organ doesn't have the power of dynamics that piano has, so pressing a key only produces a sound. You cannot make it louder or quieter like you can do on piano. Okay, enough with the instruments, let's move on to the types of music that was popular during the Baroque era. I've already mentioned that opera started to develop really fast and was relatively popular during the Baroque period, but we will discuss it later in the classical era. Today, right now, we will discuss what prelude, fugue and suites are. First, a little background on preludes and fugues. Bach is known for his two books for well-tempered clavier, which is a combination of preludes and fugues written for harpsichord. Nowadays, they're played on piano all the time. Every single person who ever learned how to play piano always played those preludes and fugues. There are a lot of them. You can also hear preludes and fugues as a part of a larger form of music, such as sonatas, symphonies, and things like that. In fact, preludes are usually used to start something else. It's like a warm-up, and from Latin it means to start. But there are also independent standing pieces that are preludes, and sometimes they are combined together with fugues. But the main, I guess, characteristic of a prelude is that there is no finished theme in prelude, and only a motive that develops over time constantly and flows into itself. It's not quite a rondo, it's not something that repeats all the time, it's just a, a motive that you hear, and it just develops over time. The piece we've just heard for harpsichord and piano, that's a prelude written in C major by Bach, and it's the first prelude of that well-tempered clavier book. As you could hear, there was a motive that was constantly developing over time, there wasn't a finished theme. We'll hear another example of a prelude in a few seconds. Fugue is a little different. Fugue is a polyphonic composition. There has to be a polyphony with at least two melodic lines, and sometimes there are like up to six melodic lines. And the reason for this is that unlike prelude, fugue always has a specific theme, which is also called subject or a principal theme. It's played in the main melodic line, but then it, other melodic lines imitate this very theme, usually in different scales.
This was a perfect example of a fugue written by Bach, the master of preludes and fugues in G minor. And did you guess the instrument it was played on? Correct, that was organ. The last topic for today is sweets. Sweet is really a combination of four or five dances that were popular in Europe during the Baroque era. Today we will take a listen at Sweet in G major, written by Bach, of course. He was a master of sweets. This suite actually has a prelude, which is not a dance, and as I said, prelude is something that you use to start or warm up. What a surprise! This is our theme music for today! Yes, that's the prelude that is written for the suite in G major. Okay, the first dance of a suite is always element. It's a German dance and it's moderately slow. It's serious in nature and it's usually written in quadruple meter. The element actually began its life as a dance in the Renaissance period and became very popular in the Baroque era. So take a listen at this. The second dance in a suite is always a courant. It's a triple meter dance and it existed in two versions. The French courant was generally solemn but more energetic than element. And the Italian courant was in a rapid triple meter. So take a listen at this and try to guess which one you're hearing. Sounds like an Italian courant, right? It is rapid and it sounds like a triple meter. By the way, I've just realized, I completely forgot to mention, but I hope you realized, this is played on cello. The next dance in the suite, the third dance, is Saraband. It's a Spanish triple meter dance. It is the slowest and the saddest dance in a suite, like this.
I hope you're not all falling asleep by now because of this. Okay, so the next dance, the fourth dance, usually is Jigi. It's the fastest dance in a suite in a duple meter. It's origi originated in England and Ireland as the jig and was known in France by 1650s. It always served as the final movement in a suite. So that's the standard composition of a suite. And of course, there are exceptions and many of them. In many, many cases, there would be a fifth dance that would be plucked in between a saraband and a jiggy. So our case is exactly that. And there would be different options for composers to put whatever dance they wanted to. There would be a bure, a gavotte, menuet. In our case, it is the third. A menuet is a graceful and extremely popular dance in triple meter, usually in binary form. The menuet first emerged in the middle of the 17th century and became widely popular in the Baroque period as well as classical up to Romantic era. So take a listen at the menuet in this suite as the additional fifth dance before the jiggy. curious fact is that menuet is the only Baroque dance that didn't become obsolete in the classical and romantic eras, like all the other dances, and in fact menuet was often included in an opera overture and was subsequently incorporated into a symphony, and of course menuet was a standalone dance as well. Wait, did I forget anything? Of course I did. I didn't include the jiggy to let you listen to because there was the menuet as the fifth dance. The jiggy is always the final part of a suite. It is the fastest. So take a listen. And this is how a suite ends, on a fast note. As a side thing, if you ever hear of a partita, it is the same as a suite, except it's more in an Italian style. They're more concerto-like, grand in nature. They're definitely more difficult to play and probably dance, but otherwise, they're the same. Well, hopefully this was somewhat informative, somewhat entertaining. I hope you get excited about classical music. I hope you keep exploring the world of classical music, especially the Baroque, classical and romantic eras. They are interesting and beautiful, trust me. For now, this is the time for me to say goodbye and hopefully not for too long. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss anything new. Bye bye. <laughs>